Hey ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have hormone harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of hormone harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. It is Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clap, or a high fiver. If you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. Choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Templey. Yeah, the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. to an attorney prior to and during any question. You can't afford one to court appoint one for you. You understand your rights? Your crime spree was over, son. Yeah, you thought you had it lick. But Detective Overton made you sure to turn to shit. <laughs> This episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast may contain descriptions of acts of violence or that are of a sexual nature. It should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. The facts we're retelling you were presented to us by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My description of the crime scenes are what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. And today's episode, if you can call it that, I'm going to name it, Where You At? lifers okay and it's important this is different but i have a, a lot of information to bring to you and i'm gonna be adding some stuff something to the episode that most of not can't say most of y'all have already heard but i'm gonna explain why i'm doing what i'm doing before we get started i want to say this real life real crime the podcast because of you lifers we made the finalists for best true crime podcast of the year under Discover Pods Award. So if you haven't, would you please, the the Bowden closes this Friday, y'all, November the 6th, I think it is, at 6 p.m. 
and the winner's going to be announced this weekend. As far as I'm concerned, we're already winners because we made it to the finalists and and up against the biggest shows in the world, right? And they have multi-million dollar production companies and, and different podcasts they can promote across, et cetera. We don't have that. Woody Overton doesn't have all that, you know, the big production company, et cetera. I got a hell of a producer in Toby Tom play, but I don't have multi-million dollar production company. But what I do have are lifers. And then the news article came out last year that went worldwide and said, you know, the lifers are like a cult. Well, they can call you whatever they want to as long as they don't call you late for dinner because I love you and you, you're the best fans in the world. You you got us this, this to the finalists for best true crime podcast of 2020. So let me tell you, if you haven't voted and you hear this before Friday at 6 p.m., please go to discoverpods.com. Click awards on the top of the screen. Click vote. That's the top left square. You'll enter in an email address and you scroll down. There's a whole bunch of categories, but scroll down to you see the true crime category. And we're in the true crime category. We're right in the middle of it. Real life, real crime. Click that on, on real life, real crime. And then you scroll down to the bottom and it's going to ask you to subscribe. Yes or no. Do whichever one you want to. I don't care. And then boop, hit the button and go through. So if we win it, it'd be simply fantastic. And I appreciate y'all for nominating us. Thank you so much. You rock. For the episode, Where You At Lifers, this is not a regular story episode, y'all. It's got a story. It's the two most important stories to me is Courtney Coco. Other one I have is Miss Barbara Blunt because I want justice for both of them. Courtney Coco, if you can see my wall, Courtney Megan Coco, March 30th, 1985 through October 4th, 2004. Right here, and the other one I have is Miss Barbara Blunt's picture with a cross on it that the family gave to me. So this is love where I do make the magic happen for real life, real crime, right? And uh, those are my two most important stories because I want justice for both of them. Please, y'all, please keep continue calling your tips on Miss Barbara Blunt's. It's being worked. It's being worked. That's all I can say about it. Okay, Courtney Coco. The information I'm going to give you today, if you've heard her already, then bear with me and listen to it again. If you haven't, then it's going to blow your mind. So what happened was, y'all know we've been working Courtney Coco's case, or a lot of the, the reason I'm doing this episode is because a lot of you don't know, all right, uh, uh, the ones that are listening now, and that's the new lifers. So but we were working the case. It's not a cold case. We've been waiting on the rest since last November when I turned it back turned it over to them. The district attorney, Philip Terrell, brought the family in and said, yes, we have the right people, the whole nine yards, et cetera, and they haven't made the rest yet. But Dateline NBC, because of lifers reaching out to them over the past year, et cetera, they contacted the family, Miss Stephanie in particular, Courtney's mama, and said they wanted to feature Courtney's case on their cold case spotlight. Now, Y'all, that is not a regular television show. This is a cold case spotlight where where they spotlight cold cases on their website, and then they do it on Facebook and their Instagram just to get awareness out about the cases. And most of them, y'all, there's really no details other than, you know, this person went missing or this person was murdered and such, such date, et cetera. So what happened was the producers wanted to talk to the family and I guess they thought it was going to be like a, another regular Dateline NBC cold case spotlight. Well, wasn't so. We all got on a conference call with them to make a long story short. We had them on the phone, for the producers, for almost two hours. And I told them every single thing except for suspect names. I told them every single thing that I can't tell you as lifers yet. But I made them go off the record on most of it because I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize the prosecution. I never dreamed Dateline would have did what they did. They came out, they published an article about Courtney's case, and I've got to read it to you now because I don't think most people have read it. I read it on the crew page. I don't even know if everybody read it, listened to it on there, but this is important. I've been holding back certain information. I'm holding back a lot of information, but some key stuff and the reason I've been asking you to be patient that I've been holding back, 
I don't have to hold her back anymore because they let it out the bag. And by they, I mean the prosecution. And so I'm going to read this to you, and we're going to talk about it, and then I'll explain what else I'm doing. Y'all, I'm not going to have any announcements at the end of the episode. So LOPA, Louisiana Procurement, uh, Oregon Procurement Agency, be a hero, give the gift of life. All lifers, I love you and appreciate you. Go to my Instagram, at Real Life Real Crime, and at Woody Overton. Sign up for it. It's good stuff there, y'all. I don't post on the crew page or wherever. It's free. Sign up for it and send me a picture of it, and we're going to enter y'all into the draw. And for every 50 new people we get, um, give away a copy of my book or a face mask or a window sticker. And last thing real quick, uh, YouTube. The previously pulled Courtney Coco's episode is on YouTube. Now, it's been redone with video added to it, so it's important. Go watch it. It has interviews and during the middle of the episode that my wife has put in. Uh, 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 it just It's got a lot more information than, than just the regular podcast, so y'all go check it out. It's Real Life Real Crime Podcast. Real Life Real Crime Podcast, not just Real Life Real Crime. Search that on with podcasts on YouTube. Go to her channel. M- most of the episodes I've ever recorded there, plus a bunch of other lives, etc. But the Rapids Burning series and the previously pulled Courtney Coco episode is on there, and it has a lot of extras. It's almost like watching a movie. So that, back to Dateline. Dateline comes out on Friday I think it was a Friday night. Then now they didn't put it on their their Instagram and Facebook until Sunday, but they came out with this article on Friday. And then you're gonna hear some rustling rustling pages. And you know, I know I don't use notes, but I have to be able to read this. And I'm recording this live for Patreon members, so I'm gonna show them the pictures and stuff that are included in the article as I'm reading. So bear with me. Again, this is done by Dateline NBC. Uh, they titled it Family Still Fighting for Justice 16 Years After 2004 Murder of Courtney Coco. It's by Andrea Cavalier. It was on October the 23rd. Every year around this time, when the Louisiana air finally feels crisp and the leaves begin to change, Stephanie Belgard wishes she could skip over it. The beginning of fall, the month of October the anniversary of her youngest daughter's brutal murder. This month marks the 16th anniversary since my baby girl's been gone, Stephanie told Dateline. Year after year, I have to relive it. I wish I could just skip over it. Stephanie remembers the last time she saw her 19-year-old daughter, Courtney Coco. It was Friday, October 1, 2004. It was the opening day of squirrel season, and and we were going camping for the weekend, Stephanie said. Courtney was over at my house, and I asked her if she wanted to go with us, but she didn't want to go. She's not really the camping type. Instead, Courtney, who lived in her own place just three miles away, agreed to watch her parents' dogs until they returned home on Sunday. By Monday, Stephanie's world had come crashing down around her. On October the 4th, 2004, she received a heartbreaking call from an Alexandria police officer. They found a body in Texas wearing Courtney's graduation ring. Stephanie sobbed. I thought I was hearing things. It couldn't be her. Like maybe someone has stolen her ring. I just dropped the phone and fell to the floor. Stephanie told Dateline she remembers calling her husband, but the rest of the day was a blur. That call changed my life forever, she said. According to Alexander Police Report, Courtney's partially clothed body was found in an abandoned building on the outskirts of Winnie, Texas, about a three-hour drive from where Courtney lived in Alexandria. A man driving a backhoe past the building, which sat unfinished due to stalled construction, noticed Courtney's body and called police. According to reports, investigators suspect she had been dead for three to four days based on the decomposition of her body. An autopsy conducted on Tuesday, October the 5th, 2004, could not determine Courtney's cause of death due to the badly decomposed state of her body, but it was ruled a homicide and an investigation was launched. A week later, on October 12th, Courtney's green 1999 Pontiac Bonneville was located in Houston, Texas. 
The individuals in possession of the vehicle were questioned, but investigators would not comment on whether or not they believed they were involved in Courtney's death or why they were in possession of the vehicle. Stephanie told Dateline her daughter's belongings were still inside the car, including the white lab coat that she wore to her job as a head receptionist at a dentist's office. She always worked hard to better herself and build her future, Stephanie said. Courtney was a 2003 graduate of Alexandria Senior High School and was enrolled at Northwestern State University where she was majoring in criminal investigation. She always noticed the details, and she was so organized, Stephanie recalled. In her car, we also found this binder of bills, everything just so neat and organized, she added with a soft laugh. We also found a copy of her friend's obit she had kept, Stephanie said, Shamika, her friend who was killed, and they got this wrong, it was just weeks before. Shamika Garnett disappeared from her home in Alexandria, Louisiana, on August 13, 2004. On August 17, just two days before her 21st birthday, Shamika's body was found in a ditch along Old Boyce Road, according to the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office. Her murder has never been solved. Courtney's mother believes the murders may be connected, but investigators would not comment on the cases. Years pass, and Courtney's case turned cold. But her family continued to push for answers and in 2019 reached out to retired homicide detective and podcast host Woody Overton. When they asked me to take a look at Courtney's case, I couldn't turn it down, Overton told Dateline. Cold cases are my passion, and I really wanted to get justice for this family. Following his retirement, Overton went into private practice as a polygraph examiner and defense consultant. He began a deep dive into Courtney's case and shared his findings on the podcast Real Life, Real Crime. With the release of an eight-episode investigative podcast, Who Murdered Courtney Coco? With the hope of bringing in tips and information. It worked. There was an overwhelming response, he said. After countless interviews, a fresh look at the case, and months of dedication, I believe we know who killed Courtney Coco. Overton said he believes Courtney was strangled at her house just after midnight on October 2, 2004, and that her body was stuffed in the trunk of her car before being dumped at the abandoned building in Winnie, Texas. He added that he knows the identities of the two people he believes to be responsible for Courtney's murder. Overton's findings were shared with law enforcement. Alexandra Police Detective Tanner Dryden, the lead investigator on Courtney's case, would not comment on Overton's findings due to the case being an active investigation, but told Dateline he is working diligently to keep the investigation moving forward. Courtney's mother, Stephanie, told Dateline she met with District Attorney Philip Terrell in November of 2019, and she claims he told her that an arrest would be made within weeks, but nearly a year has passed and the family is still without answers. I know they are doing everything they can, but it's time we had answers, she said. We will fight until the end for justice for Courtney, and we want whoever did this to be held responsible. Hugo Holland, a prosecutor with the district attorney's office, told Dateline that they have met with the family several times and they are dedicated to getting justice for Courtney. This case is very much at the forefront of important cases with the district attorney's office and Alexandria police and the Rapids Parish Sheriff, Holland said, we are doing everything we can to bring justice for this family. He added that an arrest has not been made, but told Dateline they have identified the man they believe killed Courtney and are working with law enforcement agencies to gather evidence to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Courtney's family told Dateline they don't know why someone would kill Courtney, but believe she may have gotten into a bad situation where she knew something that she wasn't supposed to know. She did not strip herself down and drive three hours to Texas, her Aunt Lynn told Dateline. Someone did this to her, but for reasons we still don't know or understand. Courtney's family describes the 19-year-old as a kind person who loved people and helped everyone she came across. She just loved life, Stephanie told Dateline. She was very active. She played softball and took gymnastics for years. She loved to travel and loved to shop. 
She was a fashion diva of sorts. The youngest of three siblings, Courtney also had two nephews she adored. Her sisters and her ne- nephews miss her greatly, Stephanie said. We are a close-knit family, and it's been extremely tough for them and for all of us. Sixteen years have now passed since Courtney was murdered, but the loss is still fresh for her family. Her mother continues to push for answers and hopes by shining light on the case, justice will be swift. I know nothing can bring her back, Stephanie told Dateline. As a mother, I want to fix this. Sadly, I can't. But I kneeled at her grave and made a promise to get justice. And I'm keeping that promise. And I'll get justice. And finally, she'll be at peace. Anyone who may have information regarding Courtney's case is asked to call the Alexander Police Department at 318-449-5099. A reward of $10,000 is being offered for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for Courtney's murder. Okay, y'all, that was the Dateline article that came out that Friday evening. Guess what? It wasn't supposed to be all that. So the producer... Alexandra just absolutely hooked us up. You know why? Because she got to hear all the stuff that I know without the suspects' names. And the mama and the aunts were in the room when the production call was going on. The producer, like all you lifers out there, was moved and took the time to actually research this and look it up and go into it. And they did that. They didn't have to do it. So kudos to Dateline NBC for doing that. Now, here's the deal. A couple things we need to talk about, high points and why this is important. Number one, I've had to hold information back from y'all, so much stuff in the case because it's to release that, the things that I know that I discovered when I had boots on the ground in Alexandria, Louisiana, before I handed this back over to law enforcement would absolutely jeopardize the case. That being said, Dateline knows them, okay, and they're going to do this story. Now, they already have done me a huge favor by getting a quote from Mr. Hugo Holland. Now, let me tell you about Hugo Holland. He said that he works for the Rapids Parish District Attorney's Office. That's not exactly true. He's working for them right now. Go look him up. He is a special prosecutor that the district attorney brought in to handle Courtney Coco's case. Now, why would you bring in a special prosecutor? Because this case needs it, okay? Hugo Holland, you go look up all his cases. He handles political corruption and death penalty cases, basically. So he was brought in at some point after the meeting, but not, not last November. He wasn't in the meeting when Philip Terrell and him said, yeah, we know who did it, and we give us two weeks, we're going to make the rest, and... The time went by, and we had to wait until February, right? And we did the march, and we still didn't hear back from him. But I, t- when we asked you to back off again, it was because of when you, Hugo Holland was on the case, and he had, had actually done some meetings, if you will, with, with a Stephanie, and I knew that I could say what I knew because I said I wasn't going to. But then, hey, he told Dateline NBC he's working on the case, and – Hugo Holland kicks ass. I can tell you that. So here's the deal. This is why we're doing this today is I did a uh, on the crew page, et cetera, when Dateline released to their social media on, I think it was Sunday afternoon, we blew it up, right? And, and I did a little video on the crew page, but now I want to do it for the world. Reason why we had more views and comments on Courtney Coco's Cold Case Spotlight for Dateline on their Facebook page and Instagram and Dateline's uh, page, whatever you call it, website. Uh, Lifers went in. We did a call to action. So, so where you at, Lifers, right? And, and I, like on Rapids Burn, I mean, kept saying where you at, Rapids. Lifers stepped up and they absolutely went in there and were saying, thank you, Dateline, for, I didn't tell them what to say. So say whatever you want to say. They were saying thank you, Dateline, so much for putting the spotlight on Courtney's case. And a lot of them said thanks, Woody, or whatever, right? And thanks for a life real crime. But what's important is all the people that are 
the millions of watch Dateline that, that, that viewed it, et cetera, that don't know about Courtney's case. They haven't listened to the episodes, right? They don't know about all the the, the police line and, and hiding evidence and all the bad things that I put in the episodes that however many they were until it got to the point where I got pissed off and they wanted to take it to the DA. And I was like, no, don't take it to the DA because you have way beyond enough for a probable cause arrest. Go get the probable cause. And these guys are going to flip on each other like pancakes. Didn't do it. Took it to the DA. So I broke off ties and I did a episode, the final episode. I got I don't remember I named it. But anyway, it was just where I laid out the case facts, not speculation, not witnesses, and not how much everything that they have to go for that I brought them and that was learned during the investigation. But I only told them, I didn't do anything to hurt the case. I only said what I knew for a fact because I was told, I mean, and, and, and just I only said what was said to the suspects one and two and their attorneys when they're being questioned about Courtney's murder, okay? So everything that's on the episode, it's not going to hurt the case. But all these people from around the world are like, oh, maybe they should look at, he might be a serial killer, or maybe they should look at whatever, or who is Courtney Coco, and, you know, who is real life, real crime, or whatever. This is for all those people. Today, I'm going to re-release the episode now, oh, okay, I did that episode, let me digress. I did that episode, I did that drop, I think in October or something, maybe November, I don't remember. The um, Maybe it was late October. But it, immediately as soon as it was dropped, within 45 minutes, Miss Stephanie, Courtney's mama, called me and said, Woody, Alexander PD is asking uh, Detective Ryden, actually, it was asking you to pull it down. Not because I'd said anything wrong, because he knew his ass was going to be being a crack because I had all the inside knowledge of their investigation. Why? Because I was helping them. And so I pulled it down, not because I'd done anything wrong. I pulled it down because Miss Stephanie asked me. I didn't give a damn about uh, him being in trouble with his superiors or whatever else. Pulled it down, but guess what? Then they get the meeting with the DA. Then Philip Terrell tells them, Give me two weeks. I'm taking it to the grand jury. We're going to get these arrests. We didn't even know that, didn't even know that this guy killed her, et cetera, et cetera. And then shit, they blew her off, man. Wouldn't even return her phone calls all the way to February. We picketed it, and he wouldn't come out then and, and whatever. And then he denies having the case at all. All the lifers, when we picketed it and we did a call to action, everybody blew it up, melted their phone lines, et cetera. He gave a, a statement and, and go to our, our uh, YouTube We've done it with the videos and the news interviews and, and everything else and the pictures, et cetera. That's on there now. It's called the Previously Pool Courtney Coco episode, and it has all the videos and everything else. But Philip comes out with a statement that says, I don't even have the case, right? And and basically, um, it's a lie. Well, I guess, you know what? Maybe he wasn't, in his mind, he wasn't lying because he brought in Special Prosecutor Hugo Holland. And you heard Hugo Holland tell Dateline himself, we know who did it. We're just about trying to wrap it up the loose ends. And y'all, but by that is, I can tell you what he's thinking is she's been dead 16 years, murdered 16 years. We don't want to rush on these last couple of little final details. They're, they're going to try to bring as much everything that they can. And we want to make sure they're looking at it now from a defense attorney standpoint. How can a defense attorney come back and try to say it wasn't, it wasn't them, right? So I get that. But I'm telling you, it's coming. And the fact that Hugh Holland gave a statement to Dateline, to me, is priceless. And especially when he says, we've identified the killer, it's over with, okay? Go look the man's record up. Now, this episode today it's for all you people who have been messaging Dateline and everything about Courtney Coco's story. I am attaching the previously pulled Courtney Coco episode where I list out the facts of the case, the evidence in the case, but not everything. It's not a tenth of what's, what's going to end up going to trial, but the facts. And I asked you at the end of it, lifers, to make up your own mind on what you thought, right? Well, hell, I know what, 
what you thought. And in it's it's there way beyond a reasonable doubt. It's way, way bad, and it's way prosecutable. But I'm telling you now, I want every one of you lifers who didn't see or hear this article to go to Dateline's Facebook page and their Instagram. And under the Courtney Coco thing, please go tell them thank you. Please go tell them thank you for the national media coverage because you know what it does? First of all, it made them finally admit that they have the case, the district attorney's office, even though it's through the special prosecutor. It made them admit that. It made them admit that we got the murderer and and that they're moving forward on it. So there you have it. For all you people who looked up Real Life for Comment, I've been getting messages the last two weeks like crazy. And if you don't want to listen to the whole eight episodes or whatever it is, listen to today's episode, and I'll sum it up for you in a nutshell. And it's important. Everybody, when you listen, or all you lifers have already heard it, if you listen to it again, because it'll listen, when I listen to it again, it just makes my blood boil. But go to Dateline, please, and tell them thank you. Because we would have never got this. And I would have never been able to tell you about Hugo Holland. I would have never been able to tell you why I'm asking you to wait. Just wait another week, wait another week, et cetera. Now, I started the Rapids Burning series because I got some, I got tired of waiting also. And I got some information. And I was like, holy shit, I can't believe, believe they're even trying to say to wait on this. And it pissed me off. And that's why I got everybody to send all the information about Rapids. And we burned it down, right? And I'm still getting information daily on that. But so, lifers, where you at? Where you at, lifers? And what I need you to do, go to Dateline NBC and tell them thank you in, uh, for bringing the national spotlight to this case. Guess what? This case, like I told them, was solved by lifers calling in tips. And me, Woody Overton, you host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast with boots on the ground. I'm the one who did put the case together and gave it back to law enforcement. Go tell Dateline, thank you. Please leave whatever you say, whatever you want to say. But it's important. Guess what? Again, we had the highest response ever Dateline's ever had about little Courtney Coco from Alexander, Louisiana, beat out, not as competition, but it's important, beat out Scott Peterson, a guy who's been all over Nancy Grace and everything else in the world that murdered his pregnant wife and baby on California got the death penalty. We had the, the largest response because lifers give a damn. And so lifers where you at, all you new people that are listening because of the Dateline episode, listen to this previously pulled episode on Courtney Coco where I lay out the facts. It's important. And if you don't want to listen on the podcast, go watch it on a Real Life Real Crime podcast YouTube channel because it has the uh, excerpts from the news and all that in it. I'm not going to take any more of y'all's time. This is going to be a long-ass episode as it is, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something. But again, thank you, Andrea Cavalier, the, the producer for Dateline NBC. Lifers, where you at for Courtney Coco? Go leave them a message. And for all you listening for the first time, when you get when you hear this, all the ones that through Dateline NBC, who would have never known about Sweet Little Courtney. When you hear it, go leave a message also for Dateline. And I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Coming to you today, uh, I have a special guest and a, a family member to me now on, on the phone, and it's Miss Stephanie, who is Courtney Coco's mom. Uh, Miss Stephanie, you there? I'm here. Okay. Hey, uh, Woody. Hey, dear. Hey, everybody. Hey, all right, y'all. So, the um, Miss Stephanie has something that she wants to read, and then we're going to talk about it briefly, and then we'll explain what we're doing today. Miss Stephanie, you go ahead. Okay. Um, three months ago, um, when the final podcast came out, uh, who murdered Courtney Coco? I was asked by APD, Detective Tanner, to remove the podcast, and he said it was because of too many details. Well, we did immediately, because I did not want to interfere or hurt this investigation. And so that happened, 
any and all tips or information, anything with Courtney's case stopped. And then the investigation just inching along really slow. And who the suspects are, we walk among them. They carry on about their lives as usual while we wait for justice. And to say this is like a slap in the face is true. The number one suspect has even threatened a civil war. So with all this being said, I am asking Woody and Jim, as Courtney's mama, to the removed podcast and hopefully get people talking again. I have nothing to lose and hope that in reposting this podcast, an arrest will be made and Courtney will finally get the justice she deserves. All right. And I'm just asking y'all to please, please help us again. Yes, ma'am. And, and okay, y'all want to make something really, really clear. The When I recorded that episode myself and I dropped it that night and it wasn't even out for maybe 45 minutes and uh, Miss Stephanie asked me to take it down. And I did so at her request. I did not take mm -hmm. it down because it had too much information in it. Everything that okay. that is on the podcast, the, the suspects in the case have been questioned by the authorities with lawyers present, even at some points with lawyers present. The Everything that's in there, they already know. Their defense attorneys already know. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. Busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdown scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. And common like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., they have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash RLRC. That's uncommongoods.com slash RLRC for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, y'all. You want to set your child up for success? Is your child struggling with a specific subject or need help with the subject? Is your child ahead? Not getting challenged enough in class? Well, IXL Learning is an online learning program that enriches your homeschool curriculum. It offers practice in math, English, language arts, science, and social studies while adapting to each child, meeting them where they are. Plus, IXL encourages students to become curious and empowers them to choose how to learn. Look, we homeschool our son. No doubt about it. He's more of a visual learner, and we use IXL, and Cindy teaches him, and there are so many different benefits to the program. It adapts to exactly what he needs in different areas. So IXL is the perfect supplement to your homeschool curriculum. IXL offers interactive practice problems, educational games, 
lessons, and video tutorials for every topic you're teaching at home. It's easy to use, time-saving. Everything on IXL is organized by grade, subject, topic, and subtopic, making it simple to find activities for the exact skills you're covering. IXL offers instant feedback and explanations of new topics as kids use the program. Kids can explore any topic in any grade level. They aren't forced into a single learning path like they are on other programs. If you're homeschooling your child because they were falling behind or because they were too far ahead like our son, IXL is a great program to help them get the exact support they need. Kids love IXL's positive feedback awards and educational games. IXL is trusted by 15 million students worldwide and has proven to improve performance in over 75 scientific research studies. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And Real Life Real Crime listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash today. Visit IXL.com slash today to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. And don't forget, Real Life Real Crime listeners get 20% off. Y'all, we really do use this product and it's been a godsend. You know? And so I wasn't doing anything to hurt the investigation, but I, I still pulled the podcast because Miss Stephanie asked me to. Now, Miss Stephanie, the uh, the right after the podcast and we pulled it, you had a meeting with some officials. Yes, sir. And who, who, um, who all we was there? Went to the DA's office um, here at Rapid. And spoke with the head DA, and there was other people present in the room. And, and who's the assistant? Head, who's, um, who, can you give their victims names? Victims advocate, uh, the detectives, uh, the chief of police, and we were told in that meeting that they knew my child, that we knew who killed my child, and this needed a little more time to get everything they needed to make an arrest. And that was three months ago. And to this day, it's been arrested. And we have, um, we did a little picket a um, couple of weeks ago at the uh, Rapids Parish Courthouse, hoping that maybe if they saw us with signs demanding that the DA would do something, I personally reached out to the DA that day and told him we were downstairs to please come talk to us. And um, he uh, responded back that he was at a funeral and he would call me back ASAP. And um, I'm, I still have not heard from him as of today. Right. So um, I still have not heard from the detective since two weeks, two Thursdays ago. Right. So um, I'm, just kind of just like a stick in the mud waiting for answers right. as we've always done. Right. So that, let me clarify it for the listeners. Um, y'all apologize if it's any poor audio, the, you went to a meeting and I know you, when y'all go to those meetings, you roll family deep. This is a super strong family. Y'all. So I'm sure your mama was yes. there. Yes. My ma and your sisters, sisters were there. Yes, and they, and y'all, mm -hmm. yes. when we, we got this case file from the man, they, Every meeting they've had in 15 years, the, all the information, I mean, they they should have been detectives, okay? So I know when they went in there, yep. they don't Thank just go in there and listen. They go in there and they, they write things down, et cetera. So I just want to clarify, the, yep. the, the DA, Philip Terrell, was there? Yes, and, and, yes. And the sheriff at the time, whoever he was, that and and they he, they, he told you, just give us a couple weeks, but first of all, the most important thing is when the information that we gave them on the suspects, he told you that is correct. There's no doubt in his mind that they are the ones that murdered Courtney. Well, out and hey, murdered hey, my child. I'm sorry. That's his hey, name and everything. Stephanie, can you say it again? Because you your phone cut out. Did he tell you that the ones, the suspects we had, that that he knew that they? Yes. He, he told you where who killed my child and and that we were right. He, he specifically back number one. 
Yeah. Yes. And then didn't they? He promised to take it to a grand jury. Yes, sir. He said that that's what we would need um, to get a grand jury to, uh, I guess, see how strong of a case we have. Right. And and but, and and but you've heard nothing. Three months, y'all. Now listen, it's three. Nothing. It's three months as of yesterday. It was November the tenth, and this is now. Uh, February tenth. February tenth. So it's today, I guess. But the uh, the so this is it. And I have not edited anything, Miss Stephanie, from the first episode. I have not listened to it again, and I'm not going to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put splice you in our conversation today onto it, and then we're gonna let it go, and the people can do with it what they want. All right. Now the I know a bunch of lifers called yep. after we picketed it the other day. Uh, and they, the district attorney's standard office is they even recorded them saying that we don't have a case file. We don't have anything to do with it. APD, Alexandria PD yeah. has it. So the, if y'all, um, if y'all want to get up in arms and, 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 you know, I'm not telling you how to feel, but I can tell you how I feel about it. And if you want to do something that obviously yeah. calling the district attorney's office, ain't going to do any good. Although he promised Miss Stephanie, that, you know, give me a couple of weeks. It's been three months. And even after we picketed it that day, that's when he put the uh, released a statement to the media about he basically they don't have anything to do with it. It's APD's decision. Um, and, yeah. and he told yeah. you he was going to call you. He would call you. He was at a funeral. He never bothered to call you. ASAP. Yeah. Yes, sir. And never and called me. And, and, and so, y'all, the you did listen to it. Um, do with it what you will. And we are not going to give up on justice for Courtney, especially when the powers that be Never. sat there in the room and told her entire family that the 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 murderers they know who it is, they know we've got it right, yep. and and uh, they, you know they were going to grand jury the whole nine yards, and they only have a decency to yep. give her a phone call in three months. So, uh, Miss Stephanie. Then when we drop this episode, I, I, I reckon your phone's going to be blowing up again. They're going to ask you to pull it, et cetera. And I'm going on the record stating unequivocally. I don't know what they've got uh, evidence-wise in the last three months that they, they didn't have before. But I'm telling you, everything mm -hmm. that, that is on this episode, they, the bad guys already know. Their lawyers know. And the cops know. It's not too much information. The only the, the way... This be too much information is when the general public finds out and they really get pissed off that nothing's been done and these killers are walking free. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not taking it down yes, again. Sir. I don't care who I don't care if Donald Trump no, calls. Sir. I'm not taking it down. This is no, for Courtney. Sir. So and and, and y'all would I've, never do anything to hurt an investigation, but these facts are already known never. to these guys. But the the we're not They're already it known. That's right. That's right. We're doing it for Courtney. Yes, sir. And we want to thank everybody. For and the that's the main doing what I need to do is for Courtney. That's right. And if I get arrested or in trouble, I'm, I'm not worried about that either. That you may, I guess what? I'll be right there with you, sweetheart. All right. And and uh, yes, sir. So, but we had, we're not breaking any laws, by the way. I just want you to know that. But the we're we're going to break somebody's okay, well. somebody's ego. But uh, that's on them. Just trying to hold someone accountable for what they did that's to the right. child. Well, hey, these are elected. You didn't put there. These these are public yeah, officials that have official. they have to answer. Even the police department has to answer. I mean, it's just what it is. How dare you go three months and and, and not? So you promised you this is not the first time, Stephanie. How many years ago did you call me for the first time about this case? And then they promised you the moon and they did nothing. And then yeah. they promised you the moon and it did nothing. Yep. So, but anyway, two we, years ago. Yep. So, well, yes, sir. Well, you know, you so know. I'm ready to do what I got to do. It's it's not about me, it's about Courtney. Okay. Well, we're going to do it. And, and, um, you know, I got love for you and and the whole family, and we'll let the yes, let the craziness be what it be after the episode drops, and and we're not above picking it again or doing whatever we have to do. So um, no, sir, we're not. But y'all, so you, 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 um, Stephanie, thank you so much. Want to answer? I want to rest. Thank y'all very much for listening. All right, I, we love you, sweetie. All right. And, Okay. All right. Thank you, Woody. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Episodes coming now.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. I'm coming to you today and going to tell the story on this episode of who murdered Courtney Coco. And without a doubt, this is the most important recording I've ever made and probably will ever make. Um, and, you know, I'm unscripted and unedited, et cetera, but I have been thinking for weeks now on how to present this in a chronological and order because uh, everything that I'm going to say is so important to Courtney's case. Um, so you just have to bear with me. But you know we haven't dropped an episode on Courtney for the last three weeks. This would have been the four, almost a month, because the investigation into her homicide was active and ongoing. And the last thing I would ever ever do is something to hinder the investigation by authorities into Courtney's case. I don't want to do anything or didn't want to do anything to screw up uh, any potential evidence or anything like that. And I'm not doing it now because everything I'm going to tell you today, the suspects in this case, they already know every single bit of this information they have been told this information, and not only have they been told that this information, their defense attorneys know all of this information that I'm going to present to you. Now, so there's no chance of me messing up anything or interfering with anything because they know. They've, they've been told. They've been questioned. They've done, you know, had everything presented to them that I'm going to present to you. And I'm not going to use their names, but I'm going to tell you the story of who murdered Courtney, and I'm going to present to you evidence, okay? The evidence came to light through our investigation, and then we turned it over to law enforcement and and it's come to light for, from various sources, we'll just say that. But first of all, I want to thank everybody out there. We took on this monumental task of Courtney's 15-year-old cold case. Uh, I don't know how long ago it's been, y'all. It's, it's, what, almost three months, I guess. And I promised Courtney's mama that I wasn't going to give up on this case, and I'm not going to give up on it. And the... Everything I'm going to tell you today, I've already told her, and she knows, and the family knows, and she is 100% agrees with me putting this out there. Uh, um, so we make sure we get justice for Courtney. Okay? So what I want to ask each of you to do is not, to not play armchair detective. I don't want you to come up with any theories or anything like that. I just want you to listen to the facts that have been uncovered during this investigation, the evidence that has been uncovered during this investigation since we started it. Now, you know that we took it on Courtney's case. It was 15 years old. It was frozen. It wasn't just cold. It was frozen. And we started it in... We reached out and, you know, the crowdsourcing technique and, and using the fans and the listeners and appealing to the public to come forward with information. And you answered. So many heroes, and I'm not going to name their names today either, but so many heroes stepped forward, put their own selves in jeopardy and in peril to come forward and give evidence against these two, and I'm going to call them suspects. Um, I'm going to call them suspect one and suspect two. These people came forward and, and 
listen, let me let me back up for a second. We got so many different suspects, and we didn't have tunnel vision on this. So these suspect one and suspect two weren't even on our radar when this thing started, right? And we had all of these different angles and all this tons and volumes of information, and we worked through it through seven weeks. It took Jim and I to narrow the field down and really focus in to the point where we had enough evidence where we no longer being law enforcement officers had to turn it over to the officials so they could further the investigation. Now, when we turned it over, we never quit working the case. We never quit taking new tips, new leads, and following those things down, disproving them or adding to the arsenal of evidence that we have against suspect one and suspect two. So it was a very, very thorough investigation on our end. And we, as y'all know, at a certain point, we had to present it to the, the powers that be so they could further it. Um, and today, I don't want y'all playing detective. I want you to be a jury member. I want you to act like you're a jury member in a trial and you're hearing evidence. And at the, when I get done telling all the evidence today, I want you to decide. You make your own decision on what should happen. I don't know if, what should happen. You, on, you make your own decision. At, at, you draw your own conclusions when I get done today, and you do with your conclusion what you want to, okay? I'm not telling you to do anything one way or another, but you do whatever you feel led to do, all right? And I'm certainly not doing this to put anybody on blast or say somebody's done something wrong or not done something wrong. I am laying out facts that were discovered in the investigation. And you, I want you to listen like you're a juror member. And at the end, you let whatever you think it may be, you let it be known. Okay? So, that being said, the, the um, Suspect one and suspect two, a little bit of background on them. They have been best friends since they were little boys, ride or dies, absolute best friends, running buddies, uh, did everything together, et cetera. The super, super tight way back when, at least they were in 2004, um, It came to light through one of the many tips that came to light was someone called in and said that they had a person in their life or had a person in their life previously that always said that suspect one killed Courtney Coco. And he had always been adamant that Courtney Coco was murdered by suspect number one. Now, this is ends up being suspect number two that's telling this person this over these years. And it got to the point, they were so adamant about it that the they actually made a recording of suspect two talking about suspect number one. And they did it under the guise of um, asking suspect number two, hey, have you heard about this podcast, about real life, real crime, the podcast? And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to get involved in all that. And this is on a recording, y'all. And I'm going to paraphrase it for you. But the when he said, well, you know, um, who do you think did it? And he said, suspect one did it. And he said 
Suspect one did it 16 times in s- approximately six minutes. He said it. suspect one killed Courtney Coco. And where he wasn't even on the radar at this point until during that recorded conversation, he slipped up. When the person asked him, he said, well, you know, how do you think he did it? And he said, I don't know. I don't know how he did it. He said, but man, she she looked like she was beat all to hell, bruised all up from her waist up on her body. And 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 then he realized what he said. And then and he said, he said, but I heard the autopsy report said she wasn't beaten or anything. And he said, I can't figure that out because she she looked like she was beat to hell. Well, the only problem with that is, y'all, you would not know that. That was never released to the public. It was never, it wasn't, it just wasn't done. And nobody had that information. Now, let me tell you what suspect number two was talking about. Suspect number two was talking about what we call lividity, okay? You, lividity is when you die, and your heart quits beating, whatever position you're sitting in, once your heart quits pumping the blood throughout your body, gravity takes control, and all your blood drains to the lowest point of your body, all right? And when it does that, it looks horrible. It looks like severe black and blue bruising. And you think about it, you get a bruise, somebody hits you on your arm, you get a bruise, that's because the blood pools in that spot. Or you bump into something, you get a bruise, that's because the blood pools in that spot, right? That's what gives you the discoloration. Well, when your heart quits beating, let's say you're laying down on your back and your legs are in the air, you're put in the trunk of a car uh, right after you're killed and you're left there for a couple of days, guess where all your blood's going to go? It's going to flow down towards your bottom up to your shoulders. And if your head's been up, it won't be on your head, right? But so Suspect 2 says in this recording, he said, I don't, when, when asked, how do you think Suspect number 1 did? He said, man, I don't know. But she looked like she was beat all oh, shit. Man, she was bruised from her, you know, from her, uh, from her butt to, you know, her shoulders or however it was he said it exactly. But even when he said that, I was like, holy shit, man. He, I mean, and then he said, but the, 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 the autopsy said that she wasn't beaten or anything, and, and there was no signs of trauma. He said, I can't figure that out because she was she looked like she was beat to shit. But, and she's just really black and blue from her lower part of her body to the top part. The only way you know that is if you saw it. So that's the first time that Suspect 2 comes on our radar. Now, and, and again, he, Suspect 1, uh, he said, he's adamant Suspect 1 killed her. He killed her. He killed I'm telling you, he killed her. And I'm telling you, he, he killed her. And he, I mean, 16 times he said it, and I think he said it in approximately six minutes before maybe he, you know, got uncomfortable with what he was saying, and then the rest of the recording is just fluff, uh, um, and he changed the topic. So I drove through the night and picked up that recording, and that, along with some other stuff, that we, we did have some information on Suspect 1, and I'll start to piece that together for you now. Um, suspect 1... was living with his girlfriend at the time. And on the night that the autopsy puts that Courtney Coco was killed, the night of the domino game, he was at their residence and he left the residence for approximately 30 minutes or so. And Courtney lived right down the street from him. And then he returns. And then a couple hours later, he leaves same night and he never comes back until sometime on Monday. And in fact, on Monday, 
His mother had to drive, so I'm talking about suspect one's mother, had to drive from Alexandria, Louisiana, to Lake Charles, Louisiana, to pick suspect one up, to bring him back to Alexandria. Problem with that is, his girlfriend said there's no reason for his mama to have to go down there and pick him up. He had his own vehicle here in Alexandria. I don't know where the vehicle was, but, I mean, you know, Certainly, it didn't break down or anything like that because he was driving immediately after that. Um, other th things about suspect one. The a tip was called in that suspect one asked another person to clock him in at his work on the Saturday morning, uh, the morning, the Saturday morning after the domino game. He called this guy and said, hey, man, can you clock me in, punch me in at, uh, at work? Why do you do that, right? And, and so, and he's gone and for the weekend, and he could, his mom has to go pick him up on Monday from Lake Charles. And let me tell you, geographically, Alexandria, Louisiana, is in the middle of the state. Lake Charles is in the bottom western corner of a state close to the Texas line. And, and it's probably, I don't know, 50 miles from Winnie, Texas, where Courtney's body was dumped. Okay. So, uh, immediately after that and, and after Courtney's funeral, et cetera, suspect one starts writing in his girlfriend's diary to Courtney, unsolicited. He had never written in this girl's diary before, ever. And he starts writing stuff in the diary. And she's just thought it was so freaking weird that he's writing stuff to a deceased, a murdered girl in, in her diary, right? Take it a step further. Within a couple of weeks after the funeral, he shows up at home and comes in the door and has a new comforter set that he had just purchased for them, for him and his girlfriend. And guess what? It's the exact same comforter set that went missing from Courtney's house. And that this very distinctive because it was leopard skin. Okay. I don't know too many guys are going to go out and buy a leopard skin comfort set. But he does that. He brings it home. Again, the girlfriend thought that was highly irregular uh, and strange. And the they broke up, um, I don't know, a couple months later or whatever, and then they got back together. And the girlfriend liked suspects from one's mom, and they went over to visit her at her residence. They walk in the door, suspects from one's mom, is sitting on the couch, and she's covered up in what appears to be Courtney Coco's comforter, the, the leopard skin print comforter. And she said it freaked her out. And, it, it, the, and she was like, and it just took her back. And she just, you know, was really kind of weirded out about that. And she knows, she knows what Courtney's comforter looked like. Uh, so, and, and that's a proven fact. The moving back to suspect two, suspects two the the person I'm gonna get the the audio recording for suspect two for us the um she said on that weekend, suspect two on that Friday had been in Alexandria riding four-wheelers at a place they called the Dunes with Courtney, and that he had got in a four-wheeler wreck uh, that afternoon, that Friday, and he was supposed to come to Lake Charles that weekend for a birthday party and bring a bike or something like that, and he never showed up. The... He, when he does show up, it, it's Sunday, 
sometime. Uh, he shows up, and he has a cut on his hand, a fresh cut on his hand, and he's missing his wedding ring. And when they asked him, said, you know, what happened? He said, oh, I cut my hand on a vehicle I was working on, and I lost my ring. This person was suspicious of that statement and that he had been gone all weekend, missed a birthday party, et cetera. So they went out. Now, suspect two had a job in a work van. He delivered items to convenience stores at, between Lake Charles and Winnie, Texas. The items he delivered were like over-the-counter medications and stuff like that. So he has this work van, and, um, and he, this person goes outside and looks in the work van in the back of it and sees some, a large amount of saran wrap, some drug paraphernalia, and a pair of small, size small female blue panties underwear in the back of the van. They confronted suspect one. This person confronted suspect one about the underwear, et cetera, and he he denied it and what have you, and played it off. and And he had to load his van at this time. He, he said he had to load his van and go make his delivery route. Stay with me. This is important. So he shows up after being gone. And that late that late that Sunday night, and he's got fresh cut on his hand, wedding ring is missing, and he says he has to load his van. And she, the person went outside and found the underwear and the uh, the woman's underwear in the back of the van. So. Now we're looking at two things. The because of what he said on the tape that was made for us about the bruising, the severe bruising. Man, it looked like she was beat to shit from her waist up. And and nobody knew that. And if he had taken the time to look it up, he would have known it was lividity. And it happens to every single one of us when we die, whatever position you're sitting in. The blood drains down that position, and it makes you look like you're severely bruised. So that put him on on the radar. Then that's when we found out about he, he returned that weekend, uh, late that Sunday night, had the fresh cut on his hand and the panties in the back of the van and all that. Um. Some point we. We, we turn it over and the investigation continues and the investigation shows that it's discovered well, the also some tips came in to us that suspect one straight up told them that he murdered Courtney Coco and wrapped her in her comforter and took her out and put her in the trunk of the car. All right. Now, he didn't just tell one person. He didn't just tell two people. He didn't just tell three people. He told four people. Not at the same time. He told four different people that have come forward, given sworn affidavits, and are willing to testify in court that, hey, he told me he murdered her, wrapped her up in her comforter, and put her in the trunk of the car. Now, you put somebody in the trunk of a car like that, again, it, it, and the Leviti sets in, and we know Courtney's body, when it was found Monday morning, showed advanced signs of decomposition. And at first, the detectives, Detective Rabelais and them, couldn't believe that she had only been dead for a couple of days because her, her body was so far decomposed. Well, that's because it was riding in the trunk of a car. And it was still hot that that 
time in October, the beginning of October that year. Now, you know how hot your car is when you get into it regularly, right? Like the front of your car with, with the windows, et cetera. The, the trunk is like that times a hundred. It's like literally like an oven. So that would account for the advanced decomposition. We know Courtney was seen alive that night. She's on video at a convenience store late Friday night. Um, and there's a lot more statements and, and witness that can attest to the fact that she was, she was alive late Friday night. The, he told four separate people that he murdered her at different times over, over the span of the years, four separate people. These people don't even know each other and that these people had the, the balls enough to come forward once they heard the podcast and, um, and other people said, well, this person said that suspect one told them and this part, that person was reached out to him and they were like, hell yeah. Uh, he told me, uh, um, you know, I'll never forget that he told me. And, and yes, they gave their statement. Hey y'all, let me tell you about gobble. All gobble meal kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi-glaze, cremini mushrooms, siapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something, all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real we've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door so see what a difference gobble will make for your household right now they're all for my listeners a fantastic limited time deal you get a hundred and twenty dollars off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Mochi. Mochi is a telehealth platform that connects patients seeking medication-based weight loss treatment with board-certified doctors and dietitians to help them determine the best treatment options to accomplish that goal. Mochi's program is completely virtual, meaning you can access their services anywhere in the United States and you will be meeting with their team online. You deserve doctors that listen. Mochi is dedicated to providing holistic, patient-centered care that prioritizes overall well-being with the goal of transforming how weight management is approached. Mochi Health takes a holistic approach to weight loss that includes visits with board-certified doctors, nutrition consultations, and medications delivered to your door. Science-backed medications include GLP-1s like Ozempic and generic compound versions, affordable and accessible regardless of insurance coverage. With Mochi, their dietitians work hand-in-hand with your medication to create personalized nutrition plans that fit your lifestyle. Reach your weight loss goals with science-backed, FDA-approved GLP-1 medications and support from real doctors and guidance from registered dietitians and help with making easy and sustainable changes to achieve results. Y'all have seen this. My wife has done it. My brother-in-law has done it. One of my best friends is doing it. And it really is an amazing process that works. So get started at joinmochi.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off. That's join, J-O-I-N-M-O-C-H-I.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off and let Mochi help 
change your life. And they are willing to testify in court. So that's what that's where we're, we're at, right? So the suspect two is brought in and asked about the they didn't ask him straight away or play the tape tape for him or anything like that. It asked him, do you know anything about suspect one killing Courtney Coco? Nope. Don't know anything about it. Absolutely nothing. Well, we know that's a lie. I mean, he said it 16 times in six minutes. Then they press him a little bit more and he, he gives a little bit more. And then he goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he, he gives a little bit more every time he ends up finally saying that, that suspect one told him that his mama, suspect one's mama, got Courtney's blanket out of her car and took it inside and washed it inside her residence and washed it. Well, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Why would you just say that after you've been, you changed your story so many times, why do you say that? And the one thing that never changes, y'all, and I've been doing this a long time, the one thing that never changes is the truth. You don't have to keep changing your story if you're telling the truth. So he ends up saying that uh, um, suspect one, he said, I think he said at first he told him on the phone, and then he ends up, after he's pressed a little bit further, and says, no, I actually went over there two days after Courtney's body was found, and he told me. My mama got Courtney's blanket out of comforter out of the trunk of the car and took it inside and washed it. Now, remember, this is the same blanket, allegedly, that suspect one's girlfriend saw the mama covered up in however many months later. So, suspect two continues to get pressed and to the point where you know, he just he's, doesn't say too much else other than that, and he leaves. I'm gonna look at something real quick. All right, so you suspect to worked for a delivery company, which delivered over-the-counter medications to convenience stores. His delivery route was from Lake Charles, Louisiana, to Winnie, Texas. He had a delivery van provided to him by the company that he worked for. They He had two residences at that time. One was in, in Alexandria and one was in Lake Charles. Um, the, the person that came forward about him is adamant that he was not there that weekend because they were pissed that he missed the party and didn't bring the bike like he was supposed to. Um, that person gave us a, a sworn affidavit about his strange behavior and, and his whereabouts, uh, about suspects to his whereabouts or lack thereof the weekend of the murder and his strange behavior thereafter. A person stated that he suspect two was missing that weekend, and they remember this clearly because he was to attend a work related party with that person on Friday, for which he missed because he was involved in a four wheeler accident earlier that day while chasing Courtney Coco on a four wheeler that she was looking to purchase from him. This person said that. They received a call from suspect two's mother that he was involved in the four-wheel accident at the Deans outside of Alexandria, Louisiana, and wouldn't be attending the party. Um, and this person said that they she they argued with suspect two, and that he never returned home to Lake Charles, Louisiana, that weekend. This person remembers that weekend clearly because they were incredibly disappointed in Suspect 2 and, and were angry that that Suspect 2 was missing and didn't pick up the bicycle. On October the 4th, 2004, in the early morning hours, Suspect 2 arrived back home in Lake Charles, Louisiana, 
where he resided. Um, this person says she was extremely suspicious of suspect two's behavior and drug usage. They noticed that suspect two had a cut on his hand and that his wedding band was missing. They asked him about this and he claimed that he lost the ring at the shop where he does mechanic work on the side. They didn't believe what he was saying, so they decided to look inside his van. When they looked inside the van that he used for work, they noticed some drug paraphernalia, a lot of saran wrap, along with a single pair of blue pair of blue female underwear size small. The, this person became very upset with suspect two and began accusing him of of having an affair, et cetera. Now this was only a few hours before Courtney's body was found in Win Winnie, Texas. Suspect 2 then left a few minutes later in the work van after loading his work supplies and began making his work deliveries. It's to be noted that Courtney's body, and, and I know y'all know this, but was found nude from the waist down. After the discover of Courtney, Courtney's body on October the 4th, 2004, according to this person's official statement, suspect two became obsessed with talking about Courtney. He would repeatedly would say that suspect one did this and that suspect one has the comforter that was missing from Courtney's house. This person asked suspect one how he knows that information and how he knows it's Courtney's and he wouldn't answer the question. This person stated that it was really weird that suspect two would constantly con continue to talk about Courtney like he was obsessed with her. In late 2004, this person questioned suspect two about Courtney and her death. Suspect two became irate over the questioning and began beating on this person and threw him out of a moving vehicle. This person remembers this clearly because it was the first day of a uh, of a, a new job that they had in Alexandria, and they had to be comforted by their new work associates, as it was very obvious she she was beaten up that day and had a traumatic episode. This report this person recorded a conversation that she was having with suspect two in September 2019. This was the one she recorded for us, y'all. On this voice recording. Suspect 2 stated 16 times that Suspect 1 did this to Courtney and how upset the family is going to be when they found out who actually did the murder. Suspect 2 stated that Courtney was wrapped in her comforter and put in the trunk of her car. He further stated on the audio recording that Courtney's body was black and blue from the waist up. Note, this was never known to the public or released. This is because of her position in the trunk along with the lividity, which was only present from the waist up. When law enforcement went to pick up suspect two finally to interview him, the first thing he tells the detective is when he gets to, to his residence, he says, and I quote, uh, the, the sex says he needed to, the text says he needed to go talk about uh, Courtney Coco. And suspect two says, I've waited 15 years for this. He voluntarily then went with the detectives to be interviewed about Courtney Coco's death. He did not have any involvement or knowledge about Courtney's case other than saying that suspect one had her blanket at his mother's house. He said he was told by suspect one's grandmother before changing his story later on that he was actually told by suspect one himself. So that's the first time he changed it. When asked about his whereabouts on the weekend of October 1st, 2004 through October the 4th, 2004, suspect two stated that he was at the dunes with Courtney Coco and suspect one riding four wheelers. When he got there, he injured himself and had to go to the hospital. He had to leave his four-wheeler with Courtney and came back to get it from Suspect 1 at the Dunes on Saturday, October 2nd, 2004. He said he went back 
to his residence where he slept most of the day. He left to go back home to Lake Charles, Louisiana on Sunday morning to clean out his work van and load it up for deliveries and then start early in the a.m. on Monday. Note, this is not factual because if he went home, he wouldn't have missed the party. He also did not have his work van loaded because he he had to leave for Winnie, Texas, where Courtney's body was found, and he went back to Lake Charles, Louisiana, to load his van. And that was late on Sunday night, and that's when that person found, got suspicious, and went out and looked in the van and found the panties and the saran wrap, et cetera. Um, Supposedly, he was given a, a voice stress analysis test, and he failed. After failing the voice stress analysis test, suspect two then changed the story completely. Before, he had no involvement or knowledge. Now, he started to claim the following. He claimed that he was called by suspect one two days after Courtney's body was found, which be, which would be... October 6, 2004, on a Wednesday. He claimed that suspect one told him that his mother found the comforter in his car and she took it inside and washed it. Suspect two then went on to say that he drove by the location where Courtney Coco's body was found in Winnie, Texas, one time in the early morning hours before her body was even discovered. He claimed that he didn't know her body was there at the time that he drove by. He then went back to Lake Charles, Louisiana, because he forgot his delivery load for his daily deliveries. Now, Again, he's changing his story. He, he said he had loaded the van on Sunday morning, and now it's Sunday this night, and he just happens to drive by where Courtney's body was dumped. And let me tell you something. I went there. You don't happen to drive by this place, and it had nothing to do with his delivery route. One second. Make sure I'm not missing anything. All right. So, as I told you, he changed the story again. From not knowing anything to putting himself at the body dump scene before late that night before she was found early Monday morning. Now, Listen to this. Suspect two then went on to say that he drove by the location where Courtney's body was found in Winnie, Texas, one time in the early morning hours before her body was even discovered. I told you that. Um, but the, he said he did that, but he had to run back to Lake Charles. It's not, you can't just run back to Lake Charles. It's like 50 or 60 miles to where her body was dumped. But, um, he goes back to Lake Charles because he just happened to forget all his delivery stuff, right? And that's when he showed up, cut on his hand, ring missing, and the panties were found in the van. Now listen to this. Suspect two stated that he knew that the phone records are going to put him there, meaning at the, the body dump site, that he knows his phone records are going to put him there, and that is the reason why he wanted to admit to why he was in Winnie, Texas. He said he passed by Winnie, Texas three specific times on October the 4th, 2004, before and after Courtney's body was discovered. Suspect 2 then changed the story once again that he actually got up early in the morning on Monday to clean out his van. He drove to Winnie, Texas before turning around to head home to get his workload. He doesn't remember a pair of panties being found in the van, but he did admit to drug paraphernalia and saran wrap. He stated that he didn't, he did not have a delivery near where Courtney's body was found. 
Okay, so it's to be noted that this is a 90-minute drive one way from Winnie, Texas to Lake Charles. When he comes back to load his van, because he happened to forget his, his delivery material, he comes back to load his van. That's when the, the panties were found in the van. He didn't have a delivery anywhere near where Courtney's body was found. He admits that that person confronted him. He admits to her looking through the van. He admits to her accusing him of an affair and drug paraphernalia. He then requests an attorney and is released at that time from any further questioning. A couple days later, on around 11 3 of 2019, Suspect 2 contacted two other people who came forward and, and, and made statements about this and says Suspect 2 confided in, in these people and as they as they were driving. Uh, um, and he stated. Well, these these people stated that suspect two was crying uncontrollably controllably when they first got on the phone. Suspect two said he is going to prison for the rest of his life because his DNA is on the trunk of Courtney's car. Suspect two further went on to tell them that he was in Winnie, Texas, and drove by where her body was dumped three times, but didn't know that is where her body was dumped. And it was by coincidence. He also told them that his phone records will put him there. And that is why. Uh, and, and that was because he was making deliveries in the area. And, and that's just simply not true. It didn't, the, that place where Courtney's body was recovered is nowhere near the store he had a delivery at in Winnie, Texas. So take it for that. That's suspect two. Uh, you heard the facts as they've been uncovered. His story changed continuously, and he even ends up putting himself there. He even ends up, ends up telling people his DNA is going to come back in Courtney's vehicle. When he was questioned about this, you know what his excuse was? He said, well... I'm being framed. I'm being framed um, by a person that was in my life at that time. They put my blood in Courtney's trunk of Courtney's car. That blood, by the way, y'all, was mixed with uh, Courtney's DNA. So there you have it on suspect two. Now, Bear with me one second. Back to suspect one. So I'm, I'm doing this, so I'm making sure I'm not leaving anything out. Excuse me one second. Suspect one. He was the boyfriend of this person I told y'all about in 2004. Um, this this girlfriend of his has totally been cleared in this investigation numerous times, including by myself, uh, by a polygraph, and by other people on the polygraph. Okay, this she, this she had absolutely nothing to do with it, but she did say that he left, he went missing uh, on ten one two thousand four, and for a short about for about forty minutes. And a short time later, he returned. That after forty minutes, he returned. And a short time later, he left again after midnight and did not return until Monday, October the fourth, two thousand four. And that was the morning that Courtney's body was found. Um, on that Monday, he was picked up. Suspect one is picked up in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Now, this is where suspect two has a residence at, also. He's picked up in Lake Charles, Louisiana, even though he lived in Alexandria, by his mother and was driven back to Alexandria, Louisiana. Again, 
is, is a known fact that he had his own vehicles proven by his girlfriend at the time. And so it didn't make sense as why he needed to be picked up in Lake Charles. This is confirmed by the girlfriend's statement. According to suspect two, suspect one called suspect two and asked him to come by his mother's house. Suspect two stated that when he got there, suspect one met him outside and suspect one told him that his mother found Courtney's blanket inside of his vehicle and took it inside and washed it. To date, Four witnesses have come forward and provide sworn affidavits and are willing to testify that suspect one told them directly that he killed Courtney, wrapped her body in a blanket, and stuffed her in the trunk of her vehicle. These statements came from four different people, period, uh, independent of each other, and they all had the same story. This came to light after the podcast was aired. Our podcast, Real Life, Real Crime, was aired in 2019. When Suspect One was interviewed about those people giving the sworn statements, he said they're just trying to get him fucked. And again, after Courtney's death, Suspect One started to write into his girlfriend's diary about Courtney. Um, he returns home to their residence one day with the same comfort set that Courtney had, but this one was brand new, y'all, still in the packaging. And then at some point later, they had, they broken up, got back together. They go over to visit suspect one's mom because the girlfriend liked her, walk in, and she's covered up with the leopard skin comforter, the same one Courtney had. And this goes with him supposedly telling suspect two that his mama took Courtney's comforter inside and washed it. Now, why, why would you wash it if you were going to throw it away? According to his work record, suspect one only worked 15 hours the week that Courtney died, and he was not at work on that Monday, October 4th, 2004. A witness that called into Crime Stoppers and has been verified was asked by a suspect one to clock him into work on that Saturday, October 2nd, 2004, even though he wasn't at work. He was la later picked up in Lake Charles on Monday by his mother. His alibi has always been that he was at work on that Saturday. But, when he was questioned about that alibi, he changed the story and claimed that he was at the dunes that Saturday riding four-wheelers with Courtney and Suspect 2. Suspect 1 and Suspect 2 have been best friends since they were toddlers. Suspect 2 has always made the comments to the person I mentioned that suspect one killed Courtney and his mother has the blanket. And then we're talking over a period of years, y'all. And that this is before we got her to do the recording. But on the audio recording of suspect two, he states 16 times in six minutes that suspect one killed Courtney. He further stated the family is going to be so upset when they actually found out who did it. Suspect one also supposedly failed polygraph testing. Um, there are two types of evidence, y'all. Two types. You either have direct evidence or you have circumstantial evidence. And the I want to explain this to you because it's so important that you understand. You hear people saying, oh, this case is all circumstantial. Well, Circumstantial is not a bad thing. Although this case has both elements, direct and circumstantial evidence. The This I'm actually going to read to you. I know what it is, but I want to read so it's, it can be clear and not mistaken. All right. 
There are two types of evidence from which you can determine what the facts are in this case. Direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. When a witness, such as an eyewitness, asserts actual knowledge of a fact, that witness's testimony is direct evidence. On the other hand, evidence of facts and circumstances from which reasonable inferences may be drawn is circumstantial evidence. Let me give you an example. Assume a person looks out a window and saw that snow was falling. If he later testified in court about what he had seen, his testimony would be direct evidence that snow was falling at the time and he saw it happen. Assume, however, that he looked out the window and saw no snow on the ground and that he then went to sleep and saw snow on the ground after he woke up. His testimony about what he had seen would be circumstantial evidence that it had snowed while he was asleep. The law says that both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proving a fact. The law does not favor one form of evidence over another. It is for you to decide how much weight to give to any particular evidence, whether it is direct or circumstantial. You are permitted to give equal weight to both. Circumstantial evidence does not require a greater degree of certainty than direct evidence. In reaching a verdict in a case, you should consider all evidence presented, both direct and circumstantial. Now, let me tell you something. Most people don't realize that DNA, unless you have the person on video where and they touch the counter like in a robbery and you get the DNA from that spot, that would be direct evidence. DNA left at a crime scene is circumstantial evidence. The, the, if, if I go in and I commit a crime and I cut myself and I leave my blood and I leave and my blood's there, but nobody saw me. There's no, no cameras, no witnesses, no nothing, but the crime lab comes out and they test my blood. My blood is in CODIS and it comes back as a match to me. That crime lab technician is going to testify at my trial that whatever the number is, Yes, uh, it's a one in three trillion chance that 3.6 trillion chance that, that this is not Woody Overton's DNA. Meaning that, I mean, you know, how many people are in the world, right? This is almost just unbelievable odds that it's not mine. But guess what? It's still circumstantial evidence. It's not direct evidence because it's circumstantial. You can't prove it. You have to infer by the circumstances that in the circumstances on the DNA, DNA would be is such an astronomical number that there not even that many people exist in the world that it has to be mine, but it's still inferred. So in this case, I would submit to you suspect one telling four different people that he killed Courtney. I would call that direct evidence. They heard it from his mouth, right? And maybe you could call it circumstantial. I don't know. But the, the, you know, it's, it's bad. The, uh, suspect one, certainly the, the, suspect one telling suspect two that, the blanket, his mama took the blanket out of the car and took it in the house and washed it. Well, again, that you would just throw it away if you weren't going to keep it. And suspect one's girlfriend seeing that blanket and identified it as Courtney's comforter. Suspect one uh, writing in the diary. Suspect one buying the same comforter set, doing all this stuff. You know, it is what it is. Y'all make the decision on it, okay? Suspect two putting himself at the body dump site three times because he says, I know my cell phone records are going to show that I was there. And, but he comes up with this lame ass excuse that he, he forgot to get his work stuff. And remember 
his story hadn't stayed the same through any of it. He changes, 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 changes. And so then saying, crying, saying, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life because my DNA is coming back out of Courtney's trunk. Uh, um, that's, you know, <laughs> but I was framed. Somebody put it there. I mean, come on, man. So that's it, y'all. I, I, I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out, but th those are the highlights of the facts. Now, to make an arrest in the state of Louisiana, all you have to have is probable cause. Probable cause is 50% plus one. It is not beyond a reasonable doubt. Probable cause is 50% plus one. To get a conviction in the state of Louisiana, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not going to tell you what I think, but if you were sitting there listening to the facts that I provided you tonight, as a jury member that had no prior knowledge of this case, and you put it together, and I'm sure a prosecutor would put put it together a hell of a lot better than me, and and you know whatever. But it, the if you're listening to the facts, I want you to make your own decision about suspect one and suspect two, and I want you to do with that decision what you will. So that's it. I, the we took on this case. And, you know, the, the national average of solving a cold case is one out of every 100. And the longer the case is cold, the lower that percentage of clearance rate is. We did what we said we were going to do for the family. And I told you before I started telling you all this information that the family knows everything that I've told you and Courtney's mama knows and she was absolutely on board with me telling everybody where this case is at. You be the jury. You do with it what you will. I can tell you the family's not going to take it laying down now that they know the facts. And that's just the facts that I know. And I'm sure there, there are more that I'm not privy to, and, and that's okay. But because you know, what I heard and what I know and what we developed over the case of this however many months now, it is what it is. I'm not going to say my opinion. I don't want to influence anybody one way or another. You be the jury. You decide about suspect one and suspect two. And I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. And I want justice for Courtney Coco. Thank you for listening. And I love and appreciate each and every one of you. And this story needs to be told. Justice for Courtney. I appreciate y'all. Peace. Get ready, you gonna do Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Tomplay. Hey, it's Ryan Seacrest. Life comes at you fast, which is why it's important to find some time to relax. 
a little you time. Enter Chumba Casino with no download required. You can jump on anytime, anywhere for the chance to redeem some serious prizes. So treat yourself with Chumba Casino and play over 100 online casino style games all for free. Go to ChumbaCasino.com to collect your free welcome bonus. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply.